<laughs> I'm seeing it live here coming in, so we're good. Perfect. Awesome. Well, I think uh, we are live here from Telespark. Hello, and uh, welcome everyone to Wednesday Live from Spark. Uh, first, let's start by saying happy Earth Day to everybody. I hope you're all contemplating all the big and small things that we can do for the planet here, uh, protecting this blue dot that we call home. Uh, each week, we are bringing you up close and personal with amazing people and ideas and science. And after all, the Science Center, our doors are shut, right? And we need to make sure that we are bringing that science to you. So today's event though, it has gone to the dogs. You might even see that on screen there. Um, so <laughs> we are going to be diving into the world of super power dogs. Uh, so today, if we were open, you'd be able to see an amazing film here called Super Power Dogs uh, that would be in our dome theater. Uh, so uh, I just realized uh, the clip here, we can put the clip in our Facebook live feed after um, just because, yeah. And we'll, we'll, if you want to check out the intro to that movie, but since you can't see it, we are bringing those dogs to you and uh, we'll be meeting a real superpower dog named Henry and his handler, Ian, who you can see, and Henry's face is on the screen right now. There we go, that's perfect. Uh, and we'll also be asking, speaking to uh, Dr. Rebecca Archer, a real life veterinarian, any questions that you have about dogs. So this is super exciting. So uh, we're gonna start by welcoming Henry, one of the four-legged stars of this movie. So uh, his handler uh, is Ian Bunbury here. And I'm just going to pull up this, oh, I heard a dog, was that him? Oh. All right, it's saying it's, um, oh, I'm seeing some hellos. Hello, everybody, welcome. Um, so uh, your chat is live, everybody, just letting you know. Um, and, and oh, I, I think I see Henry in the background there. Um, so get in those questions, Ian, but I'll start off, uh, Ian, by asking you, what does an avalanche uh, rescue dog do? Oh, oh you, you actually want to talk to, to, to me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hi, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to this live feed. Um, we're complete amateurs of this, so please uh, keep your expectations low and we'll try to exceed them. Uh, sorry, Zach, what was the question? The question, how, what does an avalanche rescue dog do? Henry's job, first of all, we are members of the Canadian Avalanche Rescue Dog Association. We're a nonprofit registered charity here in Canada. And our mission statement is to save the life of an avalanche victim. We've got about 35 teams throughout the mountainous avalanche regions of Western Canada and the Yukon. Uh, we have some associate members down in America as well, but because they can't meet our requirements, they can't actually be members. But nevertheless, Henry's job, the essence of Henry's job is to indicate to me where human scent is rising up through the snow, where an avalanche victim has been buried. It's my job to recognize that little change in his body language, uh, which is an indication to me of where the scent is rising up through the snow. So it sounds very simple and the, the essence of it, it, it is, but it's built on literally thousands of hours of training and spending time together and getting to know each other and, and, and building a working bond. Awesome. So uh, keep those, I see everyone saying hello, um, but yeah, if you have questions and uh, hey, some folks are asking uh, if it is available on YouTube live and it is. Uh, so if you need to check it out there, it should be populating our questions in here too. Uh, and look, there's Henry, what impeccable timing. Uh, and what, uh, where was Henry bred, Ian? Henry uh, came from, a, uh, it was bred by a woman named Mary Lou Campbell. Uh, her outfit is called Boywood Border Collies and She's out of Claremont, Ontario, which is apparently an hour and a half or so north of Toronto. I've never been there myself. Uh, she and I keep uh, trying to cross paths and one day it will happen because I know she's super proud of this guy and the things that she, he's doing. He's a good guy. He's incredibly handsome. Um, and so what, what type? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what what type of before? Oh, you know, how could you not say it, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, what, what uh, breed is he? Henry is a purebred border collie. Um, he might be a little bit unusual for some of the viewers. Most people associate uh, the black and white red, or sorry, the black and white rough coated ones. I've had two of those in my previous dogs, but I'd always wanted a red and I'd always wanted a smooth coat. And uh, I wound up getting that in both of those. And uh, this is probably going to be my last working dog. I'm 
approaching uh, retirement. And uh, these guys, you know, it's a, it's a big commitment. When you take on one of these guys, you're looking at a, a working career of at least 10 years. Uh, the border collies are notoriously long lived. This guy should last to be about 15. We just celebrated Henry's, excuse me, we just celebrated Henry's eighth birthday last week. And maybe if we have time later, we can celebrate it again with his favorite Ooh. treat. I, I love that idea. And he clearly loves you, uh, judging by uh, how he was leaning into you and snuggling up there. That's very cute. Yeah, and we've got our first question. Okay. Um, if you're ready to rock. Uh, yep. How often do you need to brush a dog's teeth? Uh, well, well. I'm, I you know, know what I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave that for the vet because yeah, I, we can throw that to Rebecca. That's a great idea. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you. I have I have never brushed my dog's teeth. Um, <laughs> I, could, I could I could bring him up right here. He's got a great set of choppers. Um, he eats uh, dry kibble. He's been operating on uh, Yukonuba, uh, a Mars pet care product, for quite some time now, and he does well on it. And his teeth don't seem to be adversely affected by it. So that's what I stick with. If you want um, me to jump in, I definitely mm -hmm. can. Um, as far as uh, brushing pets' teeth goes, uh, you know what? The, the more likely you are to make it a habit, uh, same as your own teeth brushing, mm -hmm. uh, the easier it tends to go. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing, uh, you know, training kids and dogs to brush teeth uh, helps if you're consistent and helps if you start early. The other thing is start slow. If you haven't been brushing the dog's teeth, uh, since they were a tiny puppy, they're probably not going to love you shoving a toothbrush in their face. Um, so, you know, maybe figure out uh, how they feel about different toothpastes first. There's a lot of great doggy toothpastes out there in different flavors. So if they have a, a flavor that they love best, um, testing that out on them, maybe getting them to lick it off your finger first, and then working up to actually uh, having them lick it off of a toothbrush and then maybe trying to get a little bit of toothbrushing going on in there. Um, so once you've got that going on, uh, it then, you know, every day is great. If you get to it, you know, a couple of times a week, definitely better than nothing. Um, so whatever you can manage to do, some dogs are so much better at keeping your teeth clean. This is, this is the first for Henry, by the way. <laughs> He's doing great. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, Henry is an incredibly well-trained dog and most people aren't gonna be able to jump in and just get some teeth brushing going on there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the other thing I just remind people is um, same as with very, very little kids, um, dogs don't know not to swallow toothpaste. Uh, so you definitely want to pick something that's fluoride free for them. Awesome. So uh, we got a question for you, Ian. We talked a lot about training there. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. That's uh, Thanks, great. Thanks, Rebecca. I, and uh, I have a lot of questions actually about training. So this is actually a good segue. Uh, how long did it take to train? Uh, Henry? Uh, to train him to be an avalanche search and rescue mm -hmm. dog, I'm going to presume. Uh, it takes generally two years to get into operational. So it, it kind of looks like this. If you were to get a spring puppy, you would take that in, in, and you wanted to enter the Canadian Avalanche Rescue Dog Association's program. Um, you would get a dog in the, well, say you got a dog in the spring, even a fall puppy. You would go to, we have a screening course that happens at a location in British Columbia uh, once a year where anybody that wants to join the program shows up with their dog and we go through a battery of tests. If your dog makes it through that battery of tests and the rest of your profile, so you need to be an active member of a search and rescue group, you have to have a first aid ticket, a CPR ticket, uh, and have to be a strong intermediate skier. And you should also think about your lifestyle. I mean, if you're in... Remember, our motto is to save the life of an avalanche victim. You should try and be in a position where you might be able to do that. So you might be the best skier in the world, might have a fantastic dog. But if you're working as an accountant in downtown Winnipeg, you know, the chances of you, um, you know, saving the life of an avalanche victim. So you think about how much time and effort you're going to put in and money and energy into training that dog. Am I really going to be able to save the life of an avalanche victim? Say you meet all that stuff. You would leave that course as a team in training. You would have, you would have a prescription of things to do that you would uh, attempt to accomplish over the course of that summer, fall, and then you would go to your first winter course that winter. 
So your dog's about one year of age at that point. You would go to that screening course again in the spring. And then the following year, now your dog's about two years of age, your dog should meet validation at that point. So the short answer to all that was about two years. Having said that, the training is ongoing. You need to pass exams every year, uh, whether that's at a course or what we call a roadside validation. That's where the RCMP validator comes to your area and conducts an exam uh, specifically for you and the handlers that are in your area that didn't attend a course that year. But having said that, the, the training is ongoing. I mean, you should see the dog's performance uh, going up as his career goes along. Um, you, you know, the validators get to know you over time and, you know, they expect to see that your performance and your connection with the dog is increasing over that time. Um, that's kind of the short answer as to how you become or the, the training for an avalanche search and rescue dog. Hope awesome. that helped. That's yeah. Tremendous. So um, one, the, we're having a bunch of questions that want to know a little bit more about Henry's personality. Like what's the funniest or silliest or weirdest thing he's done? And is he hyper? He is not hyper. Uh, he's kind of an atypical border collie. Um, Mary Lou is one of those reputable breeders who is breeding in the best interest of the breed. And she understands that, you know, a, a hyper border collie isn't necessarily a great thing. A dog that's interested in doing his work is absolutely what she's going for. But, um, you know, I'm sure many of your viewers know border collies that are laying around the house right now. <laughs> One of Mary Lou's taglines for her breeding program is border collies with an off switch. So I don't know if you can see uh, here's there's Henry <laughs> right there just chilling out on, a, on his on his uh, just on the carpet there and that's kind of the way I like it. Um, now, if I gave him the word, you know, the S word or anything else, and maybe we'll do that a little bit later, um, he'd be ready and raring to go. Um, he's, he's quite reserved, um, as your viewers may or may not know, border collies are renowned for their ability to keep stock calm while they're, while they're working them. And this sort of feeds into Mary Lou's breeding program is, you know, she wants dogs that can remain calm and focused, attentive to their handler, but when, you know, it's time to, to do the work, they're there for you. I've seen some people that are, uh, that have border collies that are weighing in on the chat as well. And they're, uh -huh. uh, they're, they're very excited to hear about uh, all the border collie information. This is tremendous. Uh, I have a question for you directly, Ian. Uh, yeah. What got you started and interested in uh, the avalanche rescue? Um, we're here for a while, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can <laughs> all day. No, okay, no, I, I won't take that long. But I first got exposed to first of all, we had there was a dog in my household when I was born, so I've been around dogs my entire life. When I was in my uh, early teens, um, even younger than that, my dad became involved in North Shore Rescue, which is a famous search and rescue group on the North Shore Mountains of Vancouver. Uh, he met a friend there who had a beautiful, absolutely beautiful, all black German Shepherd. And uh, this dog had a, had a tracking title on it and they were using it for search and rescue work. And that's when I first became exposed to search and rescue dogs and working dogs in general. And to me, I did, obviously at, at 10, 11, 12 years old, I really didn't, you know, think about the relationship and with that, but I was just struck by how, and, and the dog was well trained already. I mean, I didn't really do any of the training with it, but occasionally this guy would let me have, have the dog for the weekend. He was a semi-professional football player. He would go away, he'd let me have the dog for the weekend. And I just thought it was so cool that a, a small child could have this uh, interactive, mutually beneficial relationship with a, a species or a, a member of another species. I thought that was so cool, right? And again, you know, he had done all the training, so the dog was quite compliant, but nevertheless, um, we wound up getting a female bred, a female German Shepherd bred her with his German Shepherd and wound up getting some puppies. I took the pick of that litter and formed a really nice relationship with that dog. Didn't really do anything, didn't title the dog, didn't work the dog in any profile or like that, but just had a really great time with him until he died prematurely of uh, gastric torsion. That's where their stomach flips over tragic way to die, terrible way to die, um, struck me deeply. And I didn't have any dogs. I, I around that time I was uh, in my late teens, 
just about to start a career as a alpine ski racing coach. So I got into that and did that for a number of years. One year, uh, the team that I was working for basically disbanded on like October 30th. Season's right about to start. Hey, we're not going to have a team this year. What, you know, and at the time I probably could have pursued it and stuck with it. But at the time I was, had a long-term relationship with my partner. We were about to start a family. I thought, okay, here's a perfect opportunity to me, for me to change careers. Um, I had become friends with all the ski patrollers on the mountain because I'd lived and worked on Whistler Mountain my entire life. I was around 30 years of age at that time. And I thought to myself, hmm, this could be an, my opportunity to get into search and rescue dogs. And that's exactly what I did. I, I went into, the, went into the, uh, the interview process. There was a green dot on my interview, so I knew I had the job. First question I asked my boss was, can I get into the, the dog program? He said, no. I was oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll wait my turn. And I knew that I knew the players well enough that I knew that eventually somebody was going to be leaving uh, or retiring. And it took three or four years before my turn finally came up. And that was 1991, 92, 93. And I've been handling border collies ever since. Henry's my third dog. I had a black and white floppy eared one first. His name was Scout, fantastic dog. Uh, he was replaced by uh, another black and white, but pointy eared um, border collie named Hector. And uh, Henry was born in 2012. Um, there was a little bit of overlap there. And uh, Henry's been my dog ever since. Um, we're having a, a, a couple of questions come in for you too, Dr. Arch, if I might pop you in. Uh, one from uh, Cooper wondering about, do dogs sweat? Um, dogs do sweat, but the only place they sweat is on the pads of their feet. So kind of a neat thing, but it does mean that uh, when our temperatures do get up, um, they do have a harder time staying cool. So that's why you'll see them panting a lot, um, but really do think about how hot your dog could get uh, in certain environments where they can't go seek a cooler place for sure. Can I just throw something in there? Totally. Because um, I just learned this this year, just how important it is to keep your dog at a healthy weight. Because where for us, because we sweat, we cool ourselves through our skin surface as we <clears throat> get larger. And I hope most of you are trying to keep that to a minimum while we're all in these enclosed spaces and our, uh, our opportunities for exercise have been somewhat reduced. Anyways, as we get larger, our, surface, our cooling area gets larger. For a dog, that's not the case. So when a dog gets larger, all that area still has to be cooled by those limited areas that uh, the doctor just mentioned. So please, people, keep your dog at a healthy weight. Awesome. Um, so I'm getting a, a few, many, many questions asking how many people Henry has saved. Henry has saved this many, unfortunately. And, and uh you know, it's, it's something that we all strive for. We're all, we all want a live recovery, unfortunately. Well, it, it's sort of a good thing, bad thing. It's one of those things where you, you train, 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 but you really hope that nobody ever has to go through the horror of being caught and trapped in an avalanche for me to have to go out and do my, my job. Um, he, he has a few recoveries to his credit. Uh, one most notably back in 2017. Um, but it's, it's a crazy business. You work real hard at it, but you hope that your skills are never actually used. Um, having said that, we often use the dogs in instances where uh, there's been an, unre or an un unwitnessed avalanche. So somebody's come in from the background and you go, there's an, I've, just, I've just seen an avalanche. I didn't see it when I was out there before. There's a possibility that somebody might be stuck in there. We can send the dogs out there have the dogs run over the area and in a very short area, excuse me, very short order, uh, confirm that it's nobody buried in there. Whereas a, a human um, effort, everybody lines up with the long skinny poles and pokes holes in the snow, hugely labor intensive and the, your probability of detection is very low. Where a dog you can take in there, boom, run them across the area and know definitively there's nobody stuck in there. So that's a good thing. And while I'm at it, I mean, you know, my story, I mean, we're just one of the, one of the handlers and there's been, well, many, many handlers that are doing 
you know, the same work that I'm doing more, um, more involved, you know, Whistler is generally a, a pretty quiet area for this sort of thing. Um, or people that are in the back country are generally quite experienced, equipped, trained. Um, they have the proper equipment. They're, they're seeking out proper information through Avalanche Canada. Um, so, you know, call outs are, are relatively few and that's a good thing. Um, I'm seeing a few questions on how do we watch the film uh, that we're talking about here. Uh, it is a film that will be playing at Spark uh, when we reopen. So the Superpower Dogs uh, film, which Henry is a star of, uh, will be playing here. So um, when we reopen, you'll have to check it out. And we will link the uh, trailer in our Facebook feed so you can get uh, intrigued yeah. at the different types of rescue dogs. I just, want to, I just want to plug you a bit here, Zach. Um, yeah. You know, eventually the film will be available on Blu-ray, DVD, VHS, all kinds of different formats, right? But really, this film deserves to be seen on the giant screen. Uh, it was it was created with that in mind, and really the images that you see, and I don't just mean Henry. I mean this this uh, film takes you on a trip all the way around the world, different uh, locations, different environments. And, and really it, it deserves to be seen on the big screen. So please, when we get back, the world gets back to normal, make an effort to get to your local IMAX theater and see it in the big screen. Awesome, thank you, Ian. I uh, always love a good plug. Uh, so I have a question here for Dr. Archer. What uh, inspired you to become a veterinarian? Um, so the, the short and, and maybe humorous answer is, is I like uh, animals a bit more than I like people. Uh, and, uh, and I like medicine quite a bit. So when I was younger, um, we had a, a number of different pets, dogs, cats, horses, and, uh, and I was fascinated every time they had to to go to a, a vet and I wanted to be the person who was able to take those animals and turn them from injured or sick into whole and healthy. And we're getting a lot of questions here too about, uh, and this is kind of for both of you maybe, how are dogs similar to people? Uh, hey, Rebecca, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> <laughs> you do the science part of it first. Well, there's a lot of similarities. So um, they're mammals. We're mammals. Um, they uh, form pack bonds. We form pack bonds. Um, you know, they they really like the companionship and, and so do we. Um, we have all the same sort of internal working organs. Um, the more subtle things is all of a sudden once you get to how those internal working organs work there's some uh, there's some differences they can't take all the same medications that we can and they they don't have all the same diseases that we do but they do have some of them you know we can get diabetes so can they you know um we can get uh, uh cancer so can they you know there there's a bunch of those sorts of things that that do have some pretty serious crossovers I know uh, one of the questions, to, or did you want to add to that, Ian? Well, no, I think uh, the doctor just touched on it in her opening comment there, is they're social animals. That's why they fit so well into our, our social milieu, is that, you know, they, they recognize, you know, uppers, lowers, they, they sort of find their way into, into a social situation. And, I mean, beyond that, I mean, the superpower that, you know, Henry possesses and is what's featured in superpower dogs is, they, you know, they all have, you know, they're all featured for one particular superpower or not. But, um, you know, his sense of smell is light years so far beyond ours. And that's why we hire them to do this work, right? Is that, okay, you, you know, you can do this better than I am. I'm going to incorporate your skills to help me do my job. And, and I, I mentioned this earlier, like, to me, that's, that's the big connection, like using another animal to save a human life. Like that's, that's mind blowing. I mean, that would be a career moment for any one of us to have a, a, a live find. That's where all, that's what gets yeah, us out of bed every morning. Um, so we're seeing a few questions in the feed asking about, um, and I think uh, Dr. Archer, your, your answer kind of prompted them is, uh, and this one of course is very topical, uh, can get dogs get the coronavirus and other human colds and uh, viruses similarly? 
Actually, um, it is very topical. And I, I've spent the last two days talking to a bunch of different news agencies uh, about this particular topic. Um, I'm part of a, a task force at the University of Calgary um, that is taking a look at uh, the coronavirus and our companion animals and trying to determine uh, what's going on there and trying to get the best information that we can out to people. Um, so there is a great uh, website uh, that the University of Calgary has put out with some good questions and answers. I'll probably send that to you later so that maybe you can link that in for people who want more details. The reality is, um, as far as coronavirus goes, yes, you can give it to your cat or dog or ferret or hamster. It is a lot harder for people to give it to their dogs. Dogs don't seem very receptive to it and they certainly don't spread it amongst themselves as far as we can tell. Um, cats and ferrets and hamsters do seem to be able to get it a little bit easier and do spread it amongst themselves um, as far as we've seen in sort of uh, research trials. So you do have to be a bit careful. So um, what we're sort of asking people is to be a bit cognizant about social distancing your animals as well as you. Um, try not to be overly social. But the good news is your pet can't give it to you. Yay. Um, so no need to uh, separate from them unless you yourself think you might have COVID-19 or confirm to have it, um, in which case isolate from them in the same way that you would from other members of your household. Um, now, here's a question. Um, a lot of people are asking about uh, the S word you mentioned, Ian. Um, yes. And may maybe you can't say it right now, obviously, but uh, could you let us know what it is even by spelling it? It's S-E-A-R-C-H, search. Ah. Uh, it, I mean, he's not doing anything. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, kind, it's kind of one of those things. But anyways, that that is the word. That's what sets the whole thing off in motion and away he goes. How And how fast... Um, uh, we'll make this a two-part question for each of you. So how fast can uh, Henry run? And maybe uh, how fast can the fastest running dogs go? Well, I've seen Henry run uphill alongside my snow machine at 20 kilometers an hour. Not, not a, you know, it may say be a, you know, five, seven, eight percent grade. And he can do that endlessly. Going downhill, uh, and he can keep up with me on skis at 40 kilometers an hour. So um, he's fast. <laughs> It's pretty fast. <laughs> uh, Dr. Archer, uh, what would be the fastest running dog? So I would have to say that that's probably uh, greyhounds. They're pretty much bred to that um, as fast as they can possibly run. Um, and they are on the flat and they can clock in at about 45. Uh, oh, let me figure out. I can't remember off the top of my head. Oh, it's miles per hour. It's not kilometers per hour. So that, uh, needs to be converted into our wonderful Canadian units. That's some math homework for everybody watching. So, um, <laughs> um, so Ian, uh, yes. having a question that's come up, um, would Henry do searches in rock slides as well as avalanches? It, yes, is the short answer. Um, it, anytime you train a dog in any different thing, it's called a profile. So he, he is validated by the RCMP to work avalanches and we've sort of encompassed into that tree well searching as well. Um, that didn't used to be a thing until a number of years ago. Um, sadly, one of the, our guests here on Whistler Mountain uh, fell into a tree well and one of our dogs actually recovered her body. Um, and that sparked a whole new, oh, this is something that we never really thought of before. Let's start you know, training for that profile. Um, so, uh, I mean, even though, you know, it's more or less the same, the, I, the idea is, sorry, the environment is completely different. You're talking about snow versus dirt and, and rock and debris and all the rest of that stuff. And, and he, would, he would work it. Um, it'd be obviously a bit different. Um, you know, the, the recovery process is quite a bit different. Instead of having a bunch of guys, you know, with probes and shovels, you're going to have excavators and stuff like that. Um, this brings up a point when you do see superpower dogs, the, the feature dog in the film is Halo. Um, and that dog, you know, she searches, um, you know, earthquakes, tornadoes, you know, natural disaster, that sort of thing, uh, building collapses. 
And it's a, re it's a remarkable profile. You know, avalanche searching is, is relatively simple by comparison. You've got this big, broad, open slope that's nothing but snow. And somewhere in there, there's a, you know, there's a source of human scent rising up through it, right? Imagine now, you know, any building that you're sitting in right now, if that building were to collapse, all the things that are in that building that are, that are scented human, the dog can't indicate those. The dog can only indicate a live human. Because imagine, you know, you're spending a whole bunch of energy, you know, digging down, and you come down to, you know, a, a laundry basket full of dirty clothes. The dog can't be, dis be distracted by any of that. And, and this, it's documented very well in the film, Superpower Dogs. You'll see it there, how they, how they train the dog. And the idea, and even though it seems difficult, the idea is that the dog only gets rewarded when it finds what you're looking for, which is a live human. And uh, we have a lot of folks that are asking about uh, if they could see Henry and maybe even see him do a trick. Well, you know what? Um, Henry hasn't been fed breakfast yet this morning. And I, I did this purposely. Okay. Um, I don't actually have a lot of, well, I mean, he, he does do some things and we'll, we'll show them to you. But the one, I don't really, like I said, I don't really call it a trick. It's sort of, a, it's a demonstration thing that I do with Henry. And it's to prove, to show the dog is not using, he's only using purely his sense of smell. Um, maybe I can get my, uh, my camera operator out here and she can help me out here. Um, we're going to, I'm just going to show you first of all. So th these are the, these are the goggles here that, that you see Henry wearing the film. This is a product made by Rex Bex. Great, great company, great outfit. And it's a great product product. I wasn't really familiar with this product until, um, the producer of the film asked if, uh, Henry would wear goggles, you know, to sort of spruce up his character a little bit. So the difference. Henry is actually a character in the film. You do see Henry doing the things that he does at work, but um, he, he, he is the narrator of the film. So there's a, sort of a little bit of added thing. Now, this is a set of goggles that I got the people at Rex Specs to make, to make up for me here. They're blacked out, so he can't see anything. Um, I'm just waiting for my camera operator here to join me. Oh, it looks like my camera operator has, <laughs> has left the building. So, oh, hold on. It sounds like she is here. So let's bring Henry over here. Henry, this way here. And here we go, Henry. So there we go. We've got Henry in his Rex Specs goggles. Okay. And the first thing that we do is we make sure that he can't see anything. Okay. So we hold Henry. Henry, ask you. Here. Sit. There we go. So to make sure we, that he can't, how many fingers am I holding up, Henry? Uh, no answer. So it's pretty obvious that he can't see anything. Okay. And now what we're going to do here is we're going to sprinkle some food on the floor. Here he goes. And here he goes. Now you can see he is not bothered by the fact that he can't see one little bit there. Okay. And the, ch the challenge here in this particular little demonstration is that there's no, there's no air moving. Okay, so there's nothing moving the scent of the, those food particles to him. He's basically got to be right on top of here. So he, so he just missed that one right there because he didn't smell it. Okay, I'll just throw a few more out here. There he goes. And you can see him passing over that. So he's got to be right, absolutely right on them. You can even see little changes in his body language when he's between pieces, it's sort of casual, then all of a sudden he gets really focused for a moment. There we go. What a good dog, Henry. So, I mean, I could literally, and not, I've never tried it, but I could literally take him out onto an avalanche path, put those goggles on him and he would start searching because he's looking for, he's looking for uh, dead cells. We call them rafts. And he's, 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 he's trying to find those on the air. So there you go. We'll just leave him to that. Awesome. Thanks, Ian. There, did, you, did you enjoy that? I, I think we're seeing a lot of uh, cool, very awesome, and he's so cute, uh, seeing a lot of that uh, in our feed here. So there's a lot of, lot of love for, uh, for Henry here. <laughs> uh, Dr. Archer, we have a question for you. Um, so right now, of course, a lot of folks are at home a lot and um, 
have a lot of time working at home and things like that. Um, so it, my understanding is there's a lot of people that are adopting dogs, myself included, actually, I just adopted a dog. Um, so what should uh, people consider uh, before they get a dog or adopt a dog? I think that's a, a great point. I love how many people are adopting dogs right now. The, the shelters are, are thrilled. Um, what we really don't want to see is uh, at the end of this, people going back to work and school and, uh, and not having time for that pet anymore. Um, so you really do have to sort of consider that right now, we're in a bit of a weird spot where you have tons of time. Um, maybe take a, a think about how much time you're going to be able to dedicate to that pet afterwards. Um, so really high energy animals um, might be great for getting you out on your rocks right now, but, uh, but have a think about how energetic that animal is, how much uh, entertainment they need, um, how much uh, activity you're going to be able to provide to keep them slim. Um, so uh, thinking about all of those things and taking a look, there's such a variety of dog breeds out there, uh, depending on whether you want a, a couch cuddle companion or you want somebody to challenge you on some uh, some nature hikes. And we're having a lot of questions too here. Uh, it's a great note about um, being responsible and considerate, making sure that uh, you're going to have you know uh, a family member for many many years. Um, but obviously, a big part of that is training. So we have lots of folks here asking about training and what is the best way to do it and also hi henry um and also what is uh, and maybe uh after we kind of generally answer training maybe we can throw it in and ask specific things because i know someone was asking about how do you get them like hooked onto a helicopter like they, they mentioned their cat even is uncomfortable being lifted up so uh so maybe we'll start with you dr archer on the training conversation Sure, I would definitely agree that uh, Ian's the person to chat with in more detail about this. There are some fantastic specialists and training out there. Your Humane Society's actually got some great training resources for people. Um, what I would say from my end is keep the training positive. Positive reinforcement works way better on our companion animals than anything negative. So uh, tell them when they're doing something good uh, and ignore. Uh, when they're not doing something that you want them to do. Um, so that's going to leave the most positive impression and they're going to be more happy to continue training with you. So on that note, um, it's a lot easier to train a, uh, an animal that's food focused because you can do kibbles uh, or treats, um, but they're, you know, they, they love you and they want companionship and time. So sometimes a, a cuddle is a good positive reinforcement as well. So I'll turn that over to Ian now, because I'm sure he's got some great specifics on training. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I am a positive reward based trainer. I learned my craft or I worked on my craft down at the Michael Ellis School for Dog Trainers down in Sebastopol, Santa Rosa, Northern California. I went down there and trained with him in 2015 for three months. And I learned things that I didn't even know that I didn't even know. It was it was an amazing time for me. Um, I echo what the doctor has said there. Reward positive based training is, is, is the way I like to train. I mean, I want to have a nice friendly relationship with my dog. Um, a word that you hear us uh, at the Michael Ellis School a lot is called engagement. In what frame of mind is the dog when you go to, to do something with them? If you see like, eh, whatever, then that's probably not the time to, to undertake any training with the dog. You want the dog to be looking at you like, okay, what are we going to do next? And, and a good way to do that is through the use of food. All dogs, well, not all dogs, most dogs have got some sort of food drive. And if they don't, <clears throat> we can create that food drive <laughs> by doing what we call manipulating their food intake. Okay, so uh, don't give your dog a full three course meal and then expect him to be responsive to using food as a treat. He's already filled up, right? Um, we also use what are called markers. So what we do is we classically condition the dog to understand that when he hears a sound, there's gonna be a reward in it for him. And that's how we begin the, the, the line of communication with the dog. So as Rebecca was saying, when a dog does something well, you can communicate to that dog using markers that what you did was correct and you will get a, you get a reward for it. I wanna go back to that word engagement. Um, many of us, I'm sure there's some young viewers out there that are watching today, 
have got school teachers who, and please don't take this the wrong way, basically put you to sleep, okay? But some, most of us, all of us have had, have, people, have had people in our lives that really ignite your passion for learning, that make you wanna do things, go out there. That's what you're trying to be to your dog. Okay, you want to be that person the dog looks to and goes, okay, dad, what do you want to, you know, what are we going to do today, right? And that's the way Henry is. When I wake up in the morning and my feet hit the floor, I mean, it's not a full on party right then and there, but he's looking like, okay, some, at some point and at a lot of points throughout this day, there's going to be some fun in it for me. There's going to be rewards in it for me. And he's in a frame of mind that makes him want to learn. So I give, I use, you know, using food as direction for luring or whatever to create behaviors and he's like, wow, this is pretty cool stuff. Like, think about like all of us, like how often would you show up for your job if you weren't getting paid? Well, that's a bit of an awkward question right now because <laughs> many of us aren't showing up for our jobs right now. Um, but nevertheless, think about your dog that way is you, you, you want something from him and it's in what he learns that it's in his best interest to do something for you. He's gonna respond um, appropriately rather than, okay, He's going to drag me, by, drag me around by this leash and collar again. That's not that much fun. On the other hand, if just by touching, hang on one sec. I'm back. <laughs> just by, Henry here. There, he just touched my, touched my hand. Yes. Just touches my hand with his nose. Yes. I mark it. He gets his reward. Touches my hand, yes. Okay. Put my hand out here, yes. Oopsie, dropped it. Good dog. Okay. What a good guy. Okay. Can you wave at us? Okay. Can you wave? Henry, can you wave? <laughs> there we go. Yes. Okay. Waving, yes. There you go. So here, here, I ask him to do something. I mark it, so that's his marker. He knows that when he hears that sound, there's gonna be a reward in it for him. So here's, here's a behavior that I, I, that I taught him. Let's see if I'll do it down here. No, he's not quite getting it in this, in this environment. It was, it was the one behavior that I actually had to teach him for the film that was pretend sleeping. You see that in the opening scene of the film where he's laying on the, on the kid's bed. There we go. All right, how are we done there? Awesome, that was great. That was a fantastic, and we got a demo in there. Bonus, yeah, yeah. right? Um, so uh, one more, we have time for one more question. I'm just gonna throw it to Dr. Archer, uh, cause I saw a few people asking about why dogs eat weird things like ants and bees and other such things. That is a great question um, with a lot of, um, uh, interesting variety of answers. So uh, some dogs eat weird things because they think they're missing things from their diet. Some dogs <laughs> eat weird things because they're real excited about whatever it smells like. Um, and dogs sort of experience the world through their nose and mouth. And so if they're uncertain of, of what they're sort of seeing, um, you know, they might try and give it a sniff and, and an even better way to give it a real solid sniff uh, is to put it in your mouth first. Um, so if you think about you, if you smell something, um, you know, you, you have a, an idea of what it smells like. If you put it in your mouth and then inhale, you get a real good sense of what it smells like. So I think, think sometimes things go in dogs' mouths because they really think they're going to get a better sense of that. And then, you know, if it's not terrible, why not swallow it? Dogs seem to like to swallow things. I know my dog certainly does. Um... <laughs> Very broad definition of food. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. And thank you guys for, uh, thank you for all of you who are tuning in for asking these questions and a big thank you uh, to Ian and Dr. Archer and of course, Henry uh, for uh, helping us out and answering some questions uh, at our Spark Science from Home today. So I know some of you were asking about the movie, when can we see it? Um, when Spark is open again, we will have it here and we will be putting the uh, blurb on our social media for you to check out like a little trailer. Um, and we are also, oh, sorry, go ahead. Can I, can I throw a little plug at you there, Zach? Please do. Uh, Henry and I will be there for the premiere in Calgary. Um, so 
All you viewers that are in the Calgary area in Alberta, eastern part of British Columbia, please come out. We'd love to meet you there. Um, we're, we're potographing posters and stuff like that. You'll be able to get your picture taken with Henry and we would love to see you. And beyond that, uh, for those that can't make the premiere, get out and see this film. Your life, when I'm saying this, your life will actually be better for having seen this film. It'll, you'll walk out of that theater feeling really good. Oh, you know what? I just found out. Um, good news for those of you who are asking more questions. We're scheduled till two. Um, so we have time for more questions. Yay! All right. <laughs> so the wonders of live programming, right? Um, so uh, what is the movie about? So I know some people are asking about the movie and uh, Ian, maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, just a quick overview of what the movie is about. And also, did you get to meet Chris Evans? Uh, short answer is I did get to meet Chris Evans. If you go on our Instagram, you can see a picture of there with Henry. Uh, Henry appears with Chris uh, doing a PSA at the end of the film. Uh, Chris is a fantastic guy, very professional. You can tell right off the bat that he's a dog person. He and, he and Henry connected really well. And uh, we actually got flown out to Boston uh, for Chris to meet Henry so they could, uh, Chris could get a, a, a greater understanding of what Henry's personality was all about. And I have to say, he did a bang up job in the film. He's really captured uh, who Henry is and what Henry, is. as I mentioned earlier, Henry is a, he's a character in the film and he's really, he's captured that very well. The film uh, profiles five different, it's actually six dogs because two of them are brothers, but it, it profiles uh, five different working dogs um, Henry, the avalanche search and rescue dog, Halo, the dog that's featured throughout the film is a FEMA disaster searching dog. Uh, Reef is a water rescue dog. Uh, the two that I really, um, you know, cause I've never been to Africa. Uh, there's two bloodhounds that track poachers in Africa. And what they do is fantastic. They track poachers and help to save wildlife. And the last dog uh, that you see in the film is a dog called uh, Ricochet. And this dog is a surfing dog from San Diego that works with kids with developmental challenges and vets with PTSD. And so through that sort of triangle relationship, they all help each other. And it's, it's, a, re it's a beautiful story. I have to say, when you go see the film, bring tissues with you because there will be tears, happy tears, but uh, happy tears. And it's, it really is a fantastic film. Um, I've seen people walk out of the film walk up in, in full-blown tears. I love this dog so much. It's just, and it, it really is a feel-good film. It's about 45 minutes long, um, which to me, uh, when I thought about how much work I put into it, and then I extrapolated that to all the work that the, that the crew did to capture all of these incredible images all around the world, I went, wow, that's a lot of work for 45 minutes, but these five beautiful stories that will you'll walk out of the theater feeling much better about humans and dogs awesome thank you for that ian uh no so I, a bunch of folks are asking when is the premiere um uh, well uh we have to wait until uh we get the go ahead from uh you know, our, our governments and all that to end social distancing and we'll open up the building. And uh, when that is the case, we'll be hosting the premiere here and showcasing that. Um, so keep your eyes on our social media there. Um, now, I do have a question for you, Dr. Archer, about uh, food. Um, so folks, some folks are wondering about the best type of food uh, for their pet dog. And then maybe Ian, uh, some folks were wondering what Henry eats specifically. So there are so many food options out there. It's hard to say what exactly is the very best. Um, what we as veterinarians tend to recommend is, are the foods that have had some science behind them. We like science. Um, so the foods that have had some science behind them typ typically have a statement on the back uh, of the bag that says, um, <laughs> there he is, got it. Um, the, the statement on the back of the bag uh, says that uh, there's an AFCO statement and, and it's gonna say that there was a, a feeding trial done that just proves that this food was fed to dogs under the uh, advisement of, of a vet who's overseeing those dogs and making sure that they're totally healthy throughout the whole time that they're being fed that food. Um, and that's really important because what we've seen recently is uh, there's a lot of foods out there that don't have that statement 
and we've seen problems with some of those foods. I don't know how much you guys have heard about the grain-free diets causing heart disease. Well, those diets weren't fed as a feeding trial. Um, and so, you know, we didn't, we didn't know that they were causing problems in our dogs. So we do like those feeding trials uh, and that's usually what we're looking for. And uh, with the feeding trials, what would those look like if someone were to look for those on the bag? Uh, so there's gonna be a statement on the back. Um, any dog food that's sold in the States is going to have its uh, AAFCO or AFCO statement. And it's either going to say uh, feeding trial or formulated to meet your dog's needs. And sometimes formulated just means that the formula has changed ever so slightly since the feeding trial. So if you talk, if you're not sure, but you really like the food and you want to know more, maybe they did do a feeding trial, you can always phone the food company and they can tell you. Oh, I, I'm, I'm on. I'm, I'm sorry. I see you I, looking I, I, on the Royal Canin yeah. bag. It's going <laughs> to yeah, have a feeding yeah. trial comment on there somewhere. Um, yeah, sometimes I, it's in the fine print, but Royal Canin almost always does feeding trials on all of its food, yeah. uh, as I'm does not. Hills. Uh, you know, there's a few different ones that that are pretty consistent with that. Right. I'm I'm, I'm learning so much. I knew nothing about this stuff. I I'll, <laughs> I'll freely admit to be a kind of a not, not lazy, but I'm looking for the simplest, easiest way to feed my dog. I know uh, a lot of people are using, you know, feeding raw, and I understand and appreciate, you know, the benefits of that, all the rest of that stuff. But many years ago, when I had my first dog, I, you know, I was a dry kibble guy and always have been. And I asked my vet, I said, you know, how, how do you think the dog feels about getting fed the same dry stuff every day? And he actually surprised me. He said, you know what? They actually kind of like it because they know exactly what they're going to get every day. And for me, it's important to know what I'm putting in the dog because, uh, believe it or not, Henry actually spends a fair bit of time in a crate in the course of the day. So it's important for me to know what goes in, at what time it goes in, and what time I, I can expect things to be coming out the other end. Uh, and I know that sounds kind of weird and creepy, but you know, it's a it's a it's a part of a working dog's life. Um, and this is Royal Canaan, so this is provided to me by. Uh, Mars Pet Care. These are the people that uh, put the money in behind Superpower Dogs. And uh, Henry's been on it for a couple of years now and he's doing really well. So I, I see no reason to change. And I, and, I, and I thank Mars Pet Care for the support. We really appreciate it. Awesome. And uh, just what, we had a question from a, um, a little one. I can't remember her name. I'm sorry, but uh, she was wondering how much fur a dog has. Lots. Yeah. <laughs> Unless they're a Chinese crested, in which case very little. It's a, and it ends up all around your house, right? Um, so yeah, uh, and there are different types of, of, uh, of dog fur and that might be something interesting to sort of look up if you're thinking about getting a dog, how likely they are to shed. Um, a lot of dogs will have two different layers to their coat, an outer set of guard hairs and an inner set of sort of fuzz. Um, so, so, you know, again, taking a look and thinking about how much dog fluff do you want to clean up over the course of uh, your, your puppy, uh, puppy's lifetime is, is probably relevant as well. And you probably should mention allergies as well, doctor. I mean, there, there's some breeds that are hypoallergenic. I think a poodle is one of them. Poodle is, is really the most consistently hypoallergenic. People made a, an attempt at, uh, at breeding poodles crossed with other things to try and make them hypoallergenic. Uh, unfortunately, that's not quite how genetics works. Um, you don't, you're not guaranteed to get the, the hypoallergenicity uh, with every cross that you do. So it's kind of a bit of a, a toss up whether those uh, animals do get, uh, get that hypoallergenicity with, uh, with those poodle crosses. So labradoodles and anything that has a, a doodle sound to it. Um, so, I mean, really, if, you, if you're quite worried about allergies, poodle's probably the best way to go. And speaking of breeds, we had a question if uh, all avalanche rescue dogs from Bodie here uh, were our border collies. No, in fact, uh, the border collie is sort of the, the rarer of the breeds. Um, 
Lots of uh, laboratories right now that are being provided to us by uh, a kennel in um, Quenelle, Aramit Kennels. They've been providing us with some fantastic dogs. Lots of you know, German Shepherds traditionally in there. Um, uh, Belgian Malinois have been popular over the years. A border Collie, there's been a few of them. Uh, they've all been great dogs, but you know, the Border Collie, they, they, they lend themselves to a particular type of, of, of handler trainer. Um, you know, they're, they're really, in, in many ways, they're a fantastic. I mean, to me, it's the ideal dog. They're, you know, 45 pounds thereabouts, so I can carry them around on my shoulders quite easily. Um, you know, mechanically, they're, I mean, these dogs are bred to spend, you know, all day running, running in the, in the fields after sheep and livestock and all the rest of that stuff. Um, you know, I, and I, the, the, the trainability, the intelligence, those are all things that appeal to me as a, as a dog handler. But really what we're looking for, uh, for dogs in, in Carta, excuse me, are dogs that come from proven working lines. So if you can go and see the mom and dad working, you've got a pretty good uh, expectation that the offspring are gonna work similar to that. And this sort of brings up, and the doctor may wanna jump in on this as well, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of rescues, people that go to rescues and, and you know, get a dog and, and save it from, well, possibly euthanasia or just, you know, a really dismal life spend it, spent in, in, a, in, a, in a rescue facility. Unfortunately, and I freely admit to being a purebred dog snob because of how much time and energy and money I'm going to spend into a dog for a, a working tool that may, may uh, eventually save the life of, a, of an avalanche victim. I need to be very specific about the dog that I'm looking for, uh, you know, the personality, the, the traits that they have, because, you know, while, you know, rescues can make fantastic um, pets and, and working dogs, many of the, uh, you know, organizations down the States just go and get rescues and use them, but it, there's also a high turnover. You know, you can get two years into a dog's training when things are starting to get, you know, beyond just sort of the fun, introductory stages and now things are starting to get quite serious and there's something in the dog's past genetically you know behavior things that may have happened to him uh, things that it may have been exposed to in an early life all of a sudden the dog just hits a roadblock and goes okay i can't go any further in the training and you've just spent the last two years and hopefully it's been a good two years i mean you've spent time you know training the dog bonding with the dog connecting with the dog um but you know it's, it doesn't make it it doesn't pass its exams wash it out, bring a new one along. Awesome. Now, I think we have, uh, we're reaching the end here. Um, so um, this one last question, and maybe we can see it. Uh, does Henry know how to do high fives? Henry can do high fives. Henry here. There you go. Yes. Speaking. Uh, <laughs> speak. 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 There you go. <laughs> what better way to, to end our live stream? So uh, this time for realsies, um, thank you again, everybody. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Archer and Ian and Henry for joining us today and answering all these awesome questions that we had about dogs and uh, the Superpower Dogs movie. And um, I know we didn't get the chance to answer everyone's questions, but, uh, you know, please keep them coming. Be inquisitive. Ask the questions. Uh, and if you tune in next Wednesday, uh, we are going to be having uh, an adventurer that will be joining us for our uh, Q&A, uh, Jamie Clark and his teenage son, Kobe. Uh, Jamie has ventured to Mount Everest, get this, four times. Uh, and last year, him and his son traveled across Mongolia, which is pretty cool. So it'll be all about adventure and purpose. So check that out. Um, so that, remember, I, oh, yes, please. Can I, can I throw one more thing in there? Please do. Uh, for those of you who would like to see more of Henry and see some of the things that I do with him as a puppy, as well as some of the training, you go to my YouTube channel, Sar Dog Life, and you'll see some videos in there that show you a little bit the things. You'll also get to see Hector, but you'll see some of the things that I did with Henry to develop as a, as a young dog and some of the training the things that we do at the Carter courses. Awesome. Thanks, Ian. Thanks for letting and me get that in there. Of course, no worries. And uh, so remember, folks, uh, on this Earth Day, stay curious out there. It's how we, you know, get to expose the wonders of our universe. It's the basis of science. And for more amazing 
science folks follow us on our social media and visit us at sparkscience.ca so thank you all families uh, for joining us schools we saw many of you on here thank you all and we hope to connect with you again take care